start with uh, through uh, I will start with a, a general presentation of uh, Vermillon Energy, then the presentation of Vermillon Energy in France, and then I will talk about the technical work we are doing on the subsurface uh, point of view in France in our team. I will not speak about all the great work that the, the guys are, are doing with the on site with the operations and so on, but I will focus on the subsurface work. And then at the end, I will talk about the, the future and the challenges. First, a few words about myself. I joined the IFP school, sorry, uh, 22 years ago. I was at that time following the GOP cycle. I was sponsored by the Tux Foundation. Then in uh, 2002, I joined Basic Front Lab, an IFP consu consultancy group that you may know, first as a reservoir en uh, software engineer and then as a reservoir engineer on integrated studies, working on many oil and gas fields uh, development. In uh, 2012, in 2012, I joined Adax Petroleum Sinopec, a Chinese company, and I was a reservoir engineer working on Nigerian assets development. In 2018, I joined Perenco and I worked on Colombian Gabonese asset development. And finally, in uh, 2019, I joined Vermignon Energy and um, today I'm a reservoir engineer on working on the French assets development. And uh, I'm based in Parentis, in the land, so in the southwest of Bordeaux. We have uh, different offices in uh, the southwest and in, uh, in, in near Paris. And in the geoscience team, we have uh, we are five people working between Paris and and Parentis. First, an overview of Vermillon Energy. So Vermillon Energy is a Canadian international oil and gas company. Uh, today we say international energy energy producer. And uh, they are working mainly uh, in uh, uh, North America, Europe, and Australia. On the bottom of the slide, you can see the, the history of Vermillion that started in 1994 in Canada, then took over several fields in France in 1997. Then uh, in the 2004, they they started with Netherlands, then Aust Australia, Ireland, Germany, Hungary, more recently, Croatia, USA, and U Ukraine. Very recently, they, there was an agreement to acquire Equinox, sorry, yeah, e Equinox Energy Island Limited, which owns 36.5% interest in the Corib field in Ireland. Uh, we had already 20% of, uh, of interest in this field. And very, very recently, Vermillon uh, has entered into an, an arrangement agreement to acquire Le Crota Exploration Inc. in Canada for the very latest news. Vermillon in France now. So we are the first oil producer in France with 75% of the production in France, and it represents 1% of the French needs. We have 27 concessions with about 400 wells and three exploration permits. Uh, we have around 500 employees uh, with direct employment of 140 um, with a, a contract uh, with Vermillion. In terms of investment last year, it was about 28 million euros. So it's 10% of the total of the Vermillion's budget. It includes uh, all about maintenance, optimization, and workovers. Uh, Vermillion is also creating value for the territories with more than 1.2 billion euros invested since 1997, including, including the acquisition and the operations. Vermillion contributes also with the tax, the mineral tax. Uh, and you have an example for 2020 with 21 million euros. 
and Vermillon also supports the local community with about 70,000 euros per year. And you can see on the map that we are producing from two sides, the Paris Basin, uh, with several offices, uh, in Trigger, Saint-Méry, Vers le Grand, and in the Aquitaine Basin, with offices in Parentis, Vicbille, and Ambes. The production, uh, so this is the last year production, in average was uh, around 9,000 barrels per day. And as uh, we have very mature fields, we are also producing a lot of water. Uh, for instance, that last year it was 225,000 barrels per day of water, hot water, because it's produced from deep from the, from the ground. So one more time about our production. We are producing uh, only 1% of uh, what is consumed in France is produced in France. And the three-fourths three of that is produced by Vermignon. It's quite interesting because when you produce in France, you are emitting three times less CO2 than when you import the volumes. Now, I will go quickly through our fabulous reservoirs. So we have a wide geological panel of, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, now I'm going to focus more on the Aquitaine Basin because it's uh, where I, I I, I'm working right now. So I will not talk about the Paris Basin in the following, but more about the Aquitaine Basin. So regarding the Aquitaine Basin, we have a, a wide geological panel of uh, reservoirs with uh, fluvial sands, turbidites, carbonate platforms, mixed fascias, deep shallow deposits, fractures, faults. And we have also a wide range of characteristics for the reservoirs, heavy to light oil, Midi Darcy to Darcy reservoirs, matricial, fractured, with aquifer drive, only depletion, water injection. So we have a little bit of everything, which is very interesting. Now the Aquitaine history and the development history of, of the fields in Aquitaine. Um, the exploration started in 1939 in Aquitaine. And the first discovery, commercial discovery, was Parentis, uh, a very big field in 1954. Then several uh, more little fields, Mott, Luca, Lugos. Another bigger field, I will talk about it later in, in the examples, is Caso in 1959. Then Laverne Cabay, Vicbille, uh, close to the Pyrenees in 1979. So the, all these wells were discovered by Exxon or Esso and Vic B uh, by Total. Then Les Arbousiers, Les Pins, Courbet was also discovered by Exxon uh, Esso. And here in 1997, um, it's uh, when Vermillon took over partially uh, the Esso or Exxon fields. Then other fields were discovered and finally uh, Vermillon took over the rest of the ESO interest in France. In 2012, Vermillon took over the, the total, uh, one part of the total interest in France, including the Vic Bill field in, uh, in Aquitaine. about the Aquitaine fields. Here you can see the production of all the fields. In fact, three fourths of the production is coming from the two biggest fields that are Parentis and Caso. We have for the different fields between 15 to 60 years of production, wet production with good recoveries. We have con conventional oil plays with in total an or original oil in place about uh, 1.3 million billion barrels with a recovery to date of about 318 million barrels. And in, in the Aquitaine Basin, there are 12 concessions and two exploration permits. 
with 150 wells activated on, on pumps. I hope it's not too many numbers. <laughs> now I come to uh, the technical work. So in the geoscience team, one of the goals is to fight against the natural decline. In average, because we have quite mature fields, uh, we have a natural decline of about 10%. So if we do nothing, just the basic maintenance, the fields are going to decline with a 10% decline. So we try to fight against that. And I'm going to show you an example with CASO. So CASO is located close to the Bay of Arcachon in the southwest of Bordeaux, between uh, the Atlantic Ocean and uh, the Lake of CASO. And you can see that a big part of the wells and of the flow lines are in the forest that is between the lake and the ocean. And a few wells are in the military bases, that is uh, in CASO. Uh, the production started in 1959 for this field with an original oil place of 280 million barrels. Today, the cumulative oil is 94 million barrels, which makes uh, a current recovery factor of 34%. And the water cut is 95%, so we produce a lot of water, of course. This is what we have done since the acquisition by Vermillon Energy in 2006. So you can see that before the acquisition with the, let's say the basic maintenance of the field, the annual decline was about 12%. And after the acquisition, thanks to uh, workovers, we have not only stopped the decline, but we have also increased the production, which is today about 1,650 barrels per day. So it consists in first limit the downtime of the wells by poolings. So going and repair the wells as soon as they, uh, there is an issue. And also, and mainly workovers with uh, pumps optimization, perforation optimization uh, to increase uh, the productivity index by mainly acidifications. Additional perforations also, if we identify bypassed oil, we add perforations in order to, in to produce, uh, to incrementally produce, let's say. Water shutoff, when a part of one layer is producing too much water, we, we shut the perforation. And also water flood optimi optimization by converting uh, producers into injectors in order to improve the pressure maintenance and the sweep in the reservoir. And also something I, for, I forgot, I realized, uh, we restarted a lot of wells also that were shut in due to what was believed that, uh, to be an economic limit uh, or things like that. So a lot of wells have been restarted, optimized and so on. With the, the very good result that you can see on the screen. In CASO, you have different reservoirs. You have uh, three main reservoirs. The Albion turbidites, so it's turbidites. Huh? It's uh, sand bodies with uh, a limited volume. So the depletion when you start to produce is quite high and it, re it requires a lot of uh, injection. Um, the issue also with these turbidites is that between one well and another one, it's very difficult to correlate. So it's a complex reservoir and you need a lot of data and a good uh, picture, geological picture to, to, to understand them. With the Albion, generally, we produce a small uh, reservoir called Aption just below. So we produce these two reservoirs uh, in a commingle production. And then much lower, around 600 meters lower, you have the Purbeckian which is uh, tidal and fluvial sand. So here I give you an example of what we do in order to identify the opportunities in terms of workover and, and, and other things. 
uh, it's, you have an example on the right, is we do a well by well review. So we gather all the histories, the information we have about the well, including the, the logs, uh, the history of completion of operations, and also the, the performance in terms of, uh, of uh, flowing pressure, for instance. And then we go through all the wells and we try to see if uh, there is some oil remaining on the logs, if there is some performance issue, and we make a list of all that can be uh, possible to do. And uh, after we have the list, we rank the opportunities. And then what is uh, very efficient is that if we want to do something, we can do it the next month. We have the budget for that. And uh, so you decide to do something and you can even go to the field and see the operation live and you have the ability to follow the operation uh, and what is the result of what you have uh, planned. Of course, as the reservoirs are, are quite complex and we don't fully understand anything, we try to, uh, everything, sorry, we try uh, things and we see if it works. So it's a try and error method. And uh, when we have a portfolio of uh, workovers, we try to mix risk and less risky opportunities. And uh, we see and we learn each time we try something in terms of acidification recipe, in terms of uh, what we think are the correlation between wells, which well is talking to which well, uh, which layer could be undrained and so on. And the key also is to uh, very well um, yeah, understand as much as you can the, how, the res how the reservoir is working. So to do so, you try to integrate all the available subsurface data you have in order to have the better, the best picture of the reservoir. For instance, you have the opportunity to improve the sweep efficiency. Here, I give you an example of uh, static reservoir pressure data, static data. And uh, when we, we made the plot, so it's in a, a, a turbidite called uh, Albion B and C, we saw that uh, in this uh, turbidite, that is supposed to be only one sand body, we saw two pressure trends, and uh, one in the north and one in the south. So maybe it's in fact because there are, I don't know, um, uh, different channels in, in these turbidites. And uh, when you know that, then, then you, you have a different, for instance, uh, policy in terms of uh, water flooding and injection, because you know that the two channels are going to behave differently. Another type of data, it's just an example, but we are using the salinity of water as a, a kind of tracer for the injected water because at the beginning, the field was only or mainly producing oil and not water. So we were not able to re-inject the produced water. And in that case, at the beginning, we were massively using fresh water from shallower reservoir. So we were producing water from shallower reservoir with low salinity and injecting it in the reservoir, which has a higher salinity. And when you monitor the water salinity at the producer, you can see when the injected water is coming to the producer. And uh, when you analyze that, of course, you see what is the well that is the best responding to the injection. Uh, and you can identify the relationship between injector and producer. Just checking the time. Um, yeah, so the first part was about, let's say, the walkover fighting against the decline. Um, now I give you an example of, of the drilling portfolio. Another activity is to feed and maintain the drilling portfolio. And I give you an example with the Lavern field. So the Lavern field is also located close to the Bassin uh, to the Arcachon's Bay, Bay of Arcachon, that is here. And here we have several fields. And just there you have Lavergne, which is in Cap Ferré. Here you have another view. So all this is the Bay of Arcachon. And here in Cap Ferré, 
which is very famous. You have a lot of rich people living there. <laughs> but uh, I guess they don't know that uh, we have a field, uh, an oil field here. So, but it is the case. We have an oil field, and, and uh, the first production was in 1962. The original oil in place was uh, 38 million barrels. Today, the cumulative production is 30 million, 13 million barrels. And the water cut is 94%, recovery factor 34%. The issue with this field, and you can see it when you compare the map, the photo uh, between the 50s, 60s, and today, is that we have the shoreline erosion. So before the shoreline was here, and we had the, the wellheads somewhere. There. And because of the shoreline erosion, all this part of the land has disappeared. And uh, we were obliged in the 90s to abandon several wells. So we have abandoned this injector, and we have abandoned two very good producers that were still producing at uh, a very good rates. So the, the opportunity is maybe to drill or to redrill in this area, but uh, we, we, we had to, to see if some oil was remaining in this area. So to do so, we have made an integrated study. Several models have been built, structural models, because uh, the seismic in this area was very poor. So several interpretations were possible where possible, and 12 models have been built. With a first pass in the simulation, we have decided to, to keep only the best model that was initially best matching. And then the history match what was, um, was refined to obtain the final history match. So for this integrated study, I give you an example of, uh, of things that have been done in terms of reservoir engineering. First, you have to uh, check the production data and analyze also the production data. You have to QC also the pressure data and analyze the pressure data. QC and analyze the salinity data. QC and analyze the PVT, relative permeability, uh, capillary pressure data do the material balance. So here you have several snapshots of what has been done. For instance, for the pressure, the reservoir pressure, the result of the analysis is that you have two, two uh, trends, one for most of the wells, and then you have the lavern one that is slightly disconnected from the other wells. In terms of salinity, the same story than for Caso. We were injecting at the beginning fresh water, and we see that uh, the salinity has not uh, decreased a lot for Lavern 1. So it means also that Lavern 1 is slightly disconnected from the injector and the rest of the, of the wells. So I make it short. I will not go into too many details. But this was confirmed also by material balance. When building the material balance, the only way to match the observed pressure was to separate the Lavern 1 well in a separate pool with some uh, transmissivity with the main pool and a local aquifer for these two uh, pools. And then a kind of regional aquifer with uh, a certain transmissivity with the rest. So thanks to this reservoir engineering work, basic work, we had in mind the first conceptual model. And this is uh, the schematic, if you want, of the, of the conceptual model with Lavern 1 and even Lavern 10, slightly disconnected from the rest. Then you have a local aquifer in this area, a regional aquifer a bit further. Something that we saw also, but it's more from the well test interpretation, is that you have a vertical degradation in the fluvial sands, and also, uh, and also things that were was seen from the well test interpretation is that the permeability was lower in the aquifer here in on this well. 
and uh, the injector is injecting uh, toward all these wells, so from uh, northwest to southeast, but not much uh, going to Lavern 1 and Lavern, Lavern 10. So when you have this conceptual model in mind, you try to replicate it in the dynamic model. So the next stage was to build the dynamic model. In the dynamic model, we try to, to um, match the three or to respect the three main constraints. The first one is that there was no fresh water breakthrough at Lavern 1 in 28 years. The second constraint is that the, the fresh water breakthrough went after seven years in Lavern 2. And the last constraint was that uh, in 1993, 1994, these two wells that are very close had two very different uh, water cuts. Lavern 11 had 11% totally flushed, and Lavern 7, 80%. So the model needed to respect these three constraints plus the rest, of course. So to match, to make the history match, several things were used. The major change was about the transmissivity, transmissibilities of faults that were changed. Sometimes the faults were extended. What we wanted uh, is to have Lavern 1 slightly separated from the rest. And also Lavern 7 separated from Lavern 11 because they had two different water cuts at the same time. You can see here an example with the flow lines and the flow pass, the streamlines. In terms of permeability in the aquifer, as it was seen on the well test, the permeability was reduced in the aquifer. So at the end, we, we got a very good uh, history match and we were able to uh, find where are the opportunity in terms of drilling. So we found two, four uh, opportunities, uh, but we focused on these uh, two ones, which are a redrill of the two abandoned wells. So for these two opportunities, it represents reserves of about, let's say, one million barrels of oil uh, with a drilling uh, cost capex of 12 million euros. So this is now in our portfolio. Of course, it's competing with all the opportunities, not only from France, but from Europe and the rest of the world. So we'll see. The last technical subject is about uh, the new energies. We are making uh, technical support sometimes. I give you an example with the Condorcet High School heating project that, uh, that started uh, effectively a few, uh, few weeks ago. Um, so before the high school was heated by gas, the heat needs was uh, 850 megawatts per year. The CO2 emission uh, corresponding to that was 230 tons per year. But as we are, we have the field of Lepin with the installations very close to the high school and we are producing hot water, they wanted to investigate and we wanted to propose also to, to heat the high school with this hot water. In Lepin, we have three producers and two injectors, two injectors, and we are producing with a temperature, the water with a temperature of around 61 degrees Celsius. So here you have uh, the complete picture. So here's the Condorcet High School. Here, uh, the Lépin uh, surface facilities. All the fluid that is produced from this field, but also from two other fields, uh, for another field called Les Arbousiers, is sent to Les Arbousiers Center. Here, the fluid is separated, water and oil. The water is then sent partially to Les Arbousiers. Before that, there is some heat exchange to heat the, an eco district. So this is another project. And then the water continues. The rest of the water is sent to Lépin. 
and uh, before being injected, we wanted to, to hit the Condorcet High School. The subsurface challenge is because we, have, we are re-injecting uh, colder water compared to the, the temperature in the reservoir, what will be the interference between injector and producer? Are we going to have colder and colder water uh, as we inject? So this is to know how long we can hit the high school. To do so, we built a, a thermal model. Um, but before doing that, we needed to know how cold was the water injected in the history. Uh, we don't have any database, so uh, we had to go to the archives and to the paper copies and so on to find uh, how much fresh water was injected. Then we made hypothesis in order to know what is the profile, temperature profile of the water injected that you have in red here. So when it's 100% of fresh water, it's assumed to be 30 degrees, uh, the temperature of the injected water downhole. And uh, when it's uh, the water produced that is re-injected, it's uh, assumed to be 70%. And depending of, on the amount of fresh water injected, then you have this curve. That is an input for the simulation. This is the temperature of injected water. Then you have to find the best thermal parameters for the rock. We don't have any data because we are oil producers. We are not geothermal producers. So you have to find parameters. So we went to the literature and found uh, uh, typical values for the thermal conductivity and the, the, the heat uh, parameters. To initialize the temperature, it was a bit more simple because when we perform pressure logs or pressure surveys, we have at the same time a gauge with the temperature. So here it was easier to initialize with the temperature between uh, 99 degrees Celsius at the top and uh, 106 degrees at the bottom. And then we run the simulation to see what was the impact of the cold front in the reservoir. And you can see that this is today. And we saw that the cold front reached Lepin 1. And here is a profile of temperature of Lepin 1, which has lost about 13 degrees Celsius uh, to date because of this big amount of fresh water that was injected in the past. And also the fact that we re-inject even the produced water is colder than uh, the reservoir temperature. Then for the forecast in 2040, we'll see that the colder water front will reach the two other producers that are Lepin 3 and Lepin 5, with a, a loss of about eight degrees for these two wells. Something we wanted to do also, because uh, we are not fully sure about plenty of parameters, like the thermal properties, we have made uncertainties. We have played with the parameters and see what was the impact. All in all, the average impact of uh, the cold water front is 8%. And there is some uncertainties, but it's uh, quite limited, as you can see on, on, on the graph here. The range is very limited. So thanks to this study, we, we were confident that uh, until 2040, we will not lose a lot of temperature in the loop and we will still be able to, uh, to hit the, the high school. That's why the, the project uh, really started and the installation of the heat exchanger was, was uh, performed. I think I have to go quickly to the next point. Now, uh, the challenges. First, one of the biggest challenge, challenge is that in 2017, the ULO's law was voted. And it says that there will not be any exploration licenses granted. 
and the end of uh, exploitation will happen in 2040. So in 2040, the production of all our fields will have to be stopped. There is nothing we can do. Uh, it's, it's like that. We have to live with it. Another challenge, but this is common to every oil and gas company, we have to be able to deliver profitable projects, even at a low oil price, um, and survive to the cycles. You remember last year, we were very bad, and, uh, and, uh, and this year, it's, uh, it's wonderful. So we have to, to live with that. It's not always easy. Now about the future uh, in France, for the, oil, the production of oil in France, of course, it's challenging. We have the oil price cycles. We have the 2040 deadline. So we need a robust opportunities for port portfolio. And we have also uh, to have um, to take into account the 2040 deadline in the type, type and timing of operations we are doing. So we have to wait the, the incremental oil production versus the abandonment of uh, the installations. Also, Vermillon is uh, more oriented towards evaluating the co-generated energy, which is currently the heat with the hot water, and uh, more oriented towards the energy transition. Uh, Vermillon is also thinking about strategic changes based on different technologies. I'm going to develop to develop on the next uh, slides. So the, regarding the co-heating valuation, you have several examples that um, of things uh, Vermillon is doing. First of all, the tomato greenhouse in Parentis. So these are our surface facilities, our offices, and you can see next to it, a very big green, greenhouse. So we provide the heat uh, to this greenhouse, greenhouse, sorry. Also in La Teste, so close to Arcachon, uh, we are heating uh, houses in the eco district of La Teste. Well, uh, the high school, I already talked about it. In Vicbille, close to the Pyrenees, uh, we provide also heat for the in industrial production of spirulina. Uh, we had also the first pilot heat exchanger unit in Europe to evaluate the co-produced water into green electricity, both in, uh, in the Southwest and in the Paris basin. We are also using turbines in Vicbille, so close to the Pyrenees, to evaluate the co-produced gas into electricity. Now, the other things that are investigated are five different things. First, the hydrogen with different technologies, the water, fresh, geothermal, rare metals, algae. We, we think on how to, to produce things with, uh, with our produced water. CO2 also, we, we look at it with uh, capture, uh, carbon capture and storage. Also recycling, methanization, plastic recovering and transformation, algae also on geothermal, we were already doing it. And we have a true partnership with the French state to emphasize uh, the research on future technologies. And uh, this is it. Yes, I hope it was not too much information. If you have any question, I can see discussion here. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, thank you very much, uh, Laurent. Uh, it was uh, it was very very interesting actually. Like uh, it was uh, uh, very diverse, I would say, and and at the same time, it was very detailed. Uh, like as a res future reservoir engineer, I, I, I was like very much, uh, uh, you know, it was very much interesting to to see, you know. The, the fields, how you explain everything, because, you know, we study here the same things and, you know, seeing this at the same time uh, in practice, uh, uh, from your experience, that was uh, uh, very rewarding. So okay. thank you very much.